Well, the 2023 MotoGP season was a thriller right to the bitter end, the longest season ever. The introduction of sprint races and the breaking up of some formidable partnerships has led us to this very point right now, post-Valencia, post-Test, and with myself, Harry Benjamin, to look back at all the action over the last uh, week or so, as always, is former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Ewan and Crash MotoGP editor Pete McLaren. And we've got to start, before we do anything, Mark Marquez, that partnership with Honda has officially come to an end. He's been on the back of a Ducati now, Keith, and he's looking rather quick. I get the feeling that MotoGP next year is going to be Moto Mark Marquez. It's absolutely going to be Mark Marquez. I mean, the place is alive, isn't it? Everybody, every news outlet you look at, everybody that you deal with, everybody is talking Mark Marquez. We expected him to be fast, but I've got to say, there weren't too many of us that, that thought he would be at one point, he was the quickest in a couple of sessions out there. It's only when they cracked towards the end of it and, and you know, we got a couple of quicker times from Vinales, who was fast during the, the build-up to Valencia anyway. Brad Binder put himself in there. He does, doesn't he, in Valencia? So he was there about. Marco Bezecchi got himself a lap in as well. But Mark Marquez ending up the test in fourth place. I, I'm almost lost for words to say how good he looked. And, you know, thank God it was televised because obviously I wasn't there. But it was just a fantastic sight to see the man so enthusiastic again, to see the old Mark Marquez immediately back. You know, will that continue through the rest of the year, Pete? I'm not 100% sure of that yet. I haven't put all my um, all my money on him being world champion at the end of the year. There's a lot of people that have. There's a lot of strange places compared with Valencia. He goes good at Valencia. He was going good on the Honda during the, the, the preceding few days at the Grand Prix. Um, but I don't think... It's difficult for me as an ex-rider to be able to say how difficult it is to jump off a manufacturer of bike and all the nuances and the technical bits and pieces that are so different. The way the bike feels, the way the bike handles, the way the bike... All the little things that you need to be right under you to make work on a completely different motorbike. And bearing in mind, it is the first time he's thrown his leg over it. It was nothing short of sensational. That that smile, wasn't it, said it all after that first run when he got off the bike. I mean, it was relief, wasn't it? That's how I read it. I mean, it was that that smile. He looked at Frankie Carcetti, didn't he? His new crew chief. He taken the earplugs off the helmet, off no real reaction, and then he sort of turned to one side, big smile, and raised his eyebrows. And you know, it said, "I've made the right decision," didn't it? It probably it probably meant. That's the questions I've had in my head answered as to all the problems over the past few years. Why aren't I going as quick as these other guys? And I think it, just in that one run, the relief of, I, yeah, I've made the right choice here. I think he did have doubts, didn't he? He, he said, uh, and I, I listened to your podcast with Colin Edwards, Colin saying, you know, Mark's such a confidence guy. It's hard to imagine him having doubts about himself. But I think he genuinely did. And uh, those doubts looked to be, from the, the relief on his face, gone once he got to try this Ducati, a bike that six riders have won with this year, isn't it? Uh, it, it you know, yeah, he's made the right choice. As you say, as you say, Keith, we don't know yet what he's going to do. I think a lot of people are saying title top three. And I think that's probably at this stage, it's all speculation, but there's a big range in that, isn't it? It could be a Bezeki, which is a couple of race wins, but drop out of the title fight a couple of rounds before the end. Could be, could be a Martin, take it to the final round, but just a bit too far. Or it could be a bit Banyaya in the dream of a title in his first year at Ducati. We don't know yet. As you say, Keith Sipang, I think, the next test, that's the big one, isn't it? A, a track that he's not not so good at. Three days three days there. We need to see what the 24 bikes do. You were right uh, listing Vidalis as fast as Binder, the other guys, the factory guys. They, they were trying the new parts, weren't they? So we didn't get to see exactly what they could do on a time attack. That will come Sipang when they get some decent time on the new bikes and we get to see what sort of a jump those 24 bikes make. How much further will the 24 Ducati be from the 23 that Marquez is riding? The one thing you always have I, with new I, bikes is data. And the fact is he's going to be fast out of the box when we get to the, the, the early ones of next year. And that's what you tend to find. The 2024 bikes, they're going to be working on those and going to be working out those. I talked about nuance earlier on. Those little details that are going to get you a, a thousandth of a second here and a hundredth of a second there. Um, Mark's 2023 bike, he'll have all that data already. Everything that's, that's already been done with, with all the Ducati guys uh, that are on 23 bikes this year. Um, so that data comes straight out, and he will be fast early on, I feel. Somewhere like Sepang, I, I think it would be a delight for him. But as that settles down, as the season moves on, and the 24 bikes, the little extra bits and pieces that they, they've got out of the box, as that moves on, then we're going to see what really happens in the World Championship, I think. I mean, 
he knew how good that bike was. I mean, but from the people who'd won on it, his brother Alex, he's always said that Alex is, he always used to say Alex is actually faster than him, his younger brother. Um, but we've, we've, I know he's, he's, he's been obviously a world champion a couple of times, so he's obviously no slouch. But um, I, I've never been able to compare Alex with Mark. I mean, I've always thought Mark was a genius. Alex is just bloody good. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd take either. <laughs> but the point <laughs> being is that, that um, he knew Alex could win on that motorbike fairly fairly well and rode it really, really well. And then when Digi started to go, go, go so well on it as well, he, he knew he'd got a winning bike. And he did say, actually, no excuses. I've got no excuses, which, again, puts that pressure you were talking about, Pete, right on him. In that, yeah, you know, that anxiety that he'd got, he knew everyone else was being able to go fast on it, but you still don't know. And he's matured. He's a different. He's a different man to the one we saw back in the day. You know, when he could get away with anything that that, that he did right or wrong. Um, so I think, well, at least Julia Marquez is, is uh, now he, he, he's not split between two two parts in pit lane, is he? He can be in one garage and see both his boys out there. So I suppose that makes it a little easier for him. And uh, do you know what? Talking about testing these bikes, I mean. You know, I'm an advocate for a winter series. I, I can't wait until next bloody, you know, February, March when it all kicks off again. I think we all have a bloody one month winter series where where anything goes. You can run run what you brung. Any any factory bikes, any factory bits, any factory tires. You know, virtually no rules. Just a, just a just a, a maybe a month of a winter series where all the factories can fight. Um, with whoever they want on whatever they want, and then no, please. no holiday, no, don't <laughs> no, go home, no, don't no, see your family, no, 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 none of that. Look, I'm, I'm telling you, it's bloody hard work on my sofa here talking about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh dear, it's um, it's interesting. I was trying to explain uh, sort of this whole what was going on, this whole scenario to some of my F1 mates because they weren't quite sort of understanding of how why this was such a big deal. And I, I couldn't, I wasn't doing, I wasn't explaining it very well. And then I saw somebody tweet, uh, uh, tweet this. And it's basically this, this Mark Marquez move is essentially the same as if Lewis Hamilton decided to move to uh, the Alpha Tauri team if he was being promised a 2023 Red Bull car for 2024. That's, that's essentially the, what, what the kind of the, the, the impact of this move is. But you disagree, Keith. You're shaking your finger at me. Yeah, but the difference is, is you you strap your guys on a platform and they off they buzz. You know, the rider makes a difference in MotoGP, whereas the car guys, it's a slightly well, yeah, of again, course. I'm I'm actually you're speaking from an F1 perspective. I'm speaking from a motorcycle perspective. I might have got it as wrong as you've just got it in my view. You know, it's it's one of those ones where I think that Mark Marquez makes a difference on a motorbike. Yeah, you, know, you could put Lewis Hamilton and Alpha Tauri. He's going to make a difference but the other cars are still probably going to win because their platform is a better thing. Um, whereas, you know... No, but I suppose the idea is he's being given a 20... He's going to have the 2020 this year's spec bike, right, for next year. So it's not going to be the the current, um, uh, the top spec uh, factory bike, right? So my, my sort of then kind of worry about this, Pete, was... Oh my God! Is this going to be suddenly? Is it going to be Moto Mar- Marquez? Is it just going to? Is is there such thing as dominance in MotoGP? Is he going to dominate? We'll have to wait and see. I, I mean, I think coming back to your your analogy, that I think the general point of somebody going to compare themselves with the same machinery is correct. Let's take it like that. So there'll be nowhere to hide. He's mm. going to be on a Ducati, the same bike, you know, the top bike, the bike that so many people have won on, and and he's going to go head to head with the current generation that's why it's so exciting i think for next year we're going to see that battle that that was that was just starting to boil in 2019 fabio quattararo decided to take him on wasn't he he had a few good last lap battles and mark sort of swatted him down at the last moment but fabio was getting better and better then the injury sort of put an end to that and while he's while mark's let's say been away obviously he's been back really but not in the same way at the front the other guys have, have risen and become stronger so we haven't had that head-to-head it looks like we should now get it next year and it's a you know we saw it with Rossi in uh, you know he continued racing thankfully he didn't sort of retire early and, and you know he kept racing and we saw the young guys come up and take him on and it was some of the best years in MotoGP we could see that again I think uh, next year with the you know who's going to be there you know the, the the guys now if they if they win the world championship they'll be beating Mark Marquez on the Ducati. I mean, that will be a, a massive achievement for them. And at the same time, Mark gets the chance to show, look, I'm not done here. You know, I've just been on a difficult bike. Look out, I'm back. You're going to have to help me with this one, Pete. Nine different winners, I think, this year and no back-to-back winners for the first time, I think, uh, ever. Um, we're talking about, you know, a, a, a repeat world championship that hasn't been done since 98 or whenever at McDoan. There's been no, you know, 
you know, the world champion that's retained that the year after. I mean, there's a lot of stats from from this series that that carrying forward. Mark's in a good position. He's coming into a series where, you know, if he does have anything like the dominance that he had before, the only thing that I'm I'm kind of I think Magnaire is a very clever rider. I think the way he goes about his business, he you know, someone mentioned his name and I can't remember who it was, otherwise I wouldn't name check him, but um, who called him the professor. Now, you know, you, you, if you're going to make that car analogy again, it was, you know, Prost, Elaine Prost, always got the the kind of, he always seemed to somehow find himself in the right place at the right time. He didn't find himself there. He put himself there. And the same thing, I think, with Mark, you're suddenly going to find him. He is, he, you know, he might not be quite the guy he was, but he's still twice the guy most are. <laughs> and that is going to be interesting. And I think uh, that you were talking about the team Marquez, the Marquez brothers and all that. I, I think that's the significance there. That's what's made this move different from the Rossi to Yamaha move or the Lorenzo big moves. You know, they were really leaping into the unknown, weren't they? Whereas Mark has had his brother make this move before him. And so, as I say, it was a big relief. So he, he was obviously doubting himself, but still, you, it's hard to imagine that there wasn't some point during the summer break, you know, after Germany, when Mark was, you know, had fractures, He's at his lowest ebb, depressed, and Alex not saying to him, just as a brother, look, Mark, you know, it's not you. <laughs> it's the bike. I've ridden both, you know. And so he had that that somebody there on the inside, as you say, somebody that he rides with training every day who makes that step first, and he sees that step that they make. And I think, you know, it's worked out for him in that sense. It, with the other guys, it was a bigger gamble, but... Let's remember, in six months' time, we're all going to be saying, what's Mark going to do in 2025? Because he's only on a one-year deal. Now, I think, you know, given this this strong start that he's made, the chances of him wanting to stay at Ducati are already higher. You know, is he going to want to make that gamble again? Is he going to want to jump to a KTM, as we all imagine? Or maybe he might say, you know what, I'm done with all that factory stuff, all that developing parts, riding around, like like the KTM guys on the weekend, never having the same bike uh, on, in the test, sorry never having the bike the same for any run out of the pits because you're just, just trying new part after new part. Maybe you'll say, you know what, I've, I've done that. I just want a bike I can ride. As he had, as it looked on Monday, barely touched the setup, did they? There wasn't time. Get on it, ride it, enjoy it. Maybe that's, uh, you know, the future for Mark. It's a good point, a really good point. But, you know, I kind of go the other way with that. I think he kind of likes that. I think he's, he's got a, he's got a bit of masochism in him. He quite quite likes that. You know, those untried parts and the bits and pieces. I think somehow he, the boundaries are the things that he likes to push both on the bike and, and with the bike. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see where he heads with that. There's no doubt. And the KTM thing, you know, he's taken a massive drop in pay right now. He's in his 30s. Um, so we're, go we're going to be, he's going to be making some decisions that he wouldn't have made, you know, five, 10 years ago. Um, the, you know, he's a different perspective. Um, the fact that he's back. I mean, he's good for the sport. You've only got to look at the figures. Everybody's talking about this. And more than the car guys, all the car guys are on it. I see Karun Chandok, who is a, is a Marquez fan. He's, he's loving it right now. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, he should be as well. You know, he's, he's, he's been across it for a while. Actually, he was quite critical of a, a commentary that we did where Mark busted himself up and we were talking about his, um, his shape on the bike and the way that he was struggling with it. I mean, Karun, oh, leave him alone. So I could tell that he was a bit of a, a, bit of a, a Marquez fan back in the day. Um, and who's not? You know, I think I think the bit you you sort of just touched on it, Pete, a minute ago. You know, anybody that's in Ducati as a factory rider at the moment is going to be looking to their laurels because there's going to be one seat short in the factory team um, in a year's time if if Marcus performs as as we know he can do. It's a dilemma for them. Um, there's no doubt that, that that Ducati are going to have to make a decision if he performs in the way that everybody expects him to and the way that he has done this this week. Then. Uh, move over, whoever is the man on the second Ducati bike might find himself out of a job. Mm. Also puts a bit of pressure on Yamaha, I would say. I, I huh. mean, because, of course, Fabio is going to go, hang on a minute. We were just talking about how Mark had his brother to, to be the pathfinder, if you like. Maybe Fabio's looking and saying, how does that go if, if someone jumps on a factory team? We're going right the way back to the start of the MotoGP era, aren't we, really, where Max Biaggi dropped the factory Yamaha ride to ride a satellite Honda. Because he said, look, I just want a bike that you need to be on a Honda. And then we went through that whole 800cc era where you had to be in the factory team. The satellite teams didn't win a race, did they? And now it looks like maybe we're going back the other way where you've got to be on the, the bike, let's say, a competitive bike. And it doesn't matter whether it's factory or satellite. So it does increase the pressure on, uh, I think, Yamaha. But of course, Yamaha and Honda, they do have concessions now. Some, uh, some extra perks. So 
Yeah, well, I'll, the concessions. I love the, behind the scenes, folks. If if you if you're not actually on the on the the press release run and the like that we get from the press office at MotoGP, I love all the journalists. Everybody asking the little questions about A, B, C, and D. We've got A, B, C, and D um, concession uh, slots, if you like. Now the, the the different bikes end up in. Obviously, Ducati's in A, and then at the other end of the of the mark is Yamaha and Honda in D, who have got a few more concessions, but where do they run from? Is it part of this year and part of next year and the like? And we're going to have to do a, a proper rundown. We won't be able to talk about it here because it's just too bloody complicated, if you ask me. And after press, I haven't got across it yet, I don't think. Um, but <laughs> but while we've got Pete here, we've, we've got to talk about really Luca Marini moving across to, to Honda. That, you know, Rossi's brother, that's a big deal as well. I mean, all the headline and everything, it's actually been quite good for everyone else because everybody's focused on Mark, so everyone else can get on with their job behind the scenes for this first test because we've got a lot of riders on new motorbikes that they've never, ever ridden before. I thought Luca Marini went really, really well on that Repsol Honda. I think he actually ended up... Where did he end up? Um, he ended up in 10th place, but he was uh, the second behind Mark Marquez of the movers who was uh, moving and shaking. I thought that was a, he had a, a good weekend on that uh, Honda. Yeah, yeah, as you say, I mean, top Honda and and straight, I think straight onto the new bike. He didn't touch the old one, which was also interesting that they said, look, you know, just just go straight to the new one, which is quite visibly anyway different from uh, from the current bike, which obviously struggled this year. So, yeah, yeah, you know, I don't. There's a lot of opposite or or this some conflicting views, isn't there? A lot of people say, what's Marini doing leaving a Ducati? It's it's obviously the opposite of what Mark has done, but. I think in his position, I think it's the right thing to do. I think he's at that age where he's always said he's, he wants to be a factory rider. I remember uh, the team launch, uh, what would it have been, February this year, uh, and they did the, the media Zoom calls and things like that. And I remember asking Marini about, you know, do you think that the satellite guys should have some sort of almost like concession perks to, to help them take on the factory teams? And he was sort of adamant that, no, 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 you know, the factory teams are, you know, they're the top teams. They're where you need to be. And, uh, you know, that's where I want to be as well. So I don't want people to give me anything. I want to get to that that level of being a factory rider and, and having the whole team and being able to develop the bike. He's a very technical guy. You know, the, the team always joke about having to sort of kick him away from the computer screen and out the garage at night because he's he's sat there pouring over the data. So that's the kind of guy you need, isn't it? He doesn't override a bike. I think he scored, didn't he? He went about a year and a half finishing every single one of his first MotoGP races, I think, for the first year and a half. Uh, you know, he, he's he's a he's a he could do a Dovi. I think that's possible. A, a Dovi at Ducati. He could go there. He could work with the team. He could bring the bike up from this new era that they're in. And uh, yeah, I think it's it's the right time for him. He's three years in MotoGP. Go for it. Be a factory rider. See what you can do. I think his best chance of being successful is to build a bike around him in the way that he likes. And he's not going to get that at Ducati because he, he's in the queue, you know. And now he's got Mark Marquez ahead of him. So the chance of him getting onto a factory Ducati is slim. And let's remember, in a year's time, that VR46 bike might be a Yamaha. So, you know, it's all very well people saying you're leaving a, a Ducati, but in a year's time, that, that might be a satellite Yamaha. Now he's Valentino on a Rossi, Valentino Rossi, his brother, obviously, um, when he was interviewed over the weekend, you could tell it was a little bit of trepidation in his voice about the fact that his, his brother was going across to Honda. Obviously, you know, the doors open nicely at VR46 now for Digia to, to move across, which is, you know, there is a god, obviously, and justice is done, and he's got himself a decent bike. And first time out on it, he ended up in seventh place ahead of Luca Marini on the Honda. But I think the VR46 position, I think it's worked well for both of them. You know, you're right in what you say. You know, Marini had got no choice, really. He'd got to make that move now because all the blocks were full for, for Ducati. And like you say, with, with Mark Marquez coming in as well, there was one less going to be there. Um, somebody else I, I really want to talk to Pete about before he has to nip off, if we can. Uh, Pedro Acosta, you know, he was flying at the weekend as well. Pedro Acosta, you know, two times world champion, one in Moto3, Moto2, comes into MotoGP, jumped straight on that bike and looked at home on the Gas Gas, which is basically the KTM. And got to say, very impressed with his performance. Very impressed for the first time out. Yeah, I think for me, the two the two moments that I'll remember from this test are one, Marquez after that first run, turning to Frankie Carcetti. The second one would be Acosta sliding that bike. Uh, there, there was a clip of it. I think it was into the final corner, getting it sideways. I mean, you know, for a rookie in his first uh, cold conditions at Valencia, I know you mentioned this before, Key, cold, difficult conditions, first ride on the MotoGP bike, and there he is getting it sideways like that. I, I, really, really impressive. 
And that corner, that corner particularly, you're on the gas through half of it, and then you transit into the front to get yourself stopped for the hairpin. It's a very, very technical, difficult corner. And I'm glad you mentioned it because, okay, Moto3 world champion, Moto2 world champion, but the gizmos you've got on, on a, it'd be like getting out of your saloon car, jumping in a Formula One car with all them buttons all over the steering wheel. You've got so much stuff to contend with, ride height adjustments and God knows what that's, that, that is actually selectable by the rider himself. So a cost of the jump on a spaceship like he did and make it work like he did first time out. I think he's fired a big shot across the bowels of the uh, established guys. So good on Pedro Acosta. He ended up, out of all the movers and shakers, he ended up 18th and the last of the new guys on new bikes. But he weren't a million miles off of where he is. You know, he was quicker than the likes of Alex Rings. Cal Crutchlow was out testing as well, which was good to see this weekend. Uh, Nakagami, Alexis Spargo, I, I think... Um, well, he, he had a bit of clattering earlier on. And yeah, Lorenzo he Salvadori. was injured. He, he packed up yeah. early and went for scans on his leg, I think. Yep. Um, impressed that he was actually bothering at all, as it as it turns out. So, I mean, like, do we get to the end of every year and go, can it be as good as it's been this year? I mean, I, I have to say that 2023 with the sprint races introduced in the light, we we're all a bit, we entered this season with a bit of trepidation. But I think that the, the way that it panned out in the end, was fantastic. We got that finale. Oh, hey, Martin, I've got to say, um, as had his card marked by Mark Marquez for, for tipping him over like he did in the... Um, uh, I think that Jorge Martin being slightly forceful on uh, on Mark Marquez, I don't know what your interpretation of it was, but from where I was sat, um, it wasn't really on from that far back and he didn't really give Mark half a chance because Mark's not got a rear view mirror to see where he was and uh, being taken out. I mean, Marquez, <laughs> let's actually consider that for a minute. He nearly got his wings took off, as in his elbows, his, his his ankles and everything else. I mean, Mark Marquez, that was a massive crash that he had. He fell really, really awkwardly. You know, he got up. Okay, he got up. and it, But you have no idea how much that hurts. You don't have to break anything to be in a lot of pain. And these guys battering themselves. I mean, there are no airbags on your elbows, your knees, and your, and your, and your ankles. You know, the way he landed, he had no real protection. Um, so to test, you know, Two days later, with all those bruises and all those aches and pains coming through, and, and to perform in the way that Mark did, just doubles the the you know. Got to take your hat off to the guy. Yeah, mm -hmm. you really do, don't you? Well, look, um, Pete, we're gonna have to let you go now because you've got a proper job to do. Uh, <laughs> but thank you so much, as always, for guys. spending a bit of time with us and uh, enlightening us. We'll have to get you back uh, for our end of season review. Uh, before we all switch off into holiday mode, um, but thank you very much. Any parting words, Pete? You wanna wanna leave with us? Only only to echo what Keith said, which is uh, when does twenty twenty four start? Yeah, and when it, which I didn't <laughs> think I'd be saying when it got to it was it been eight races eight eight races in ten weeks. But uh, yeah, you know that that test day yesterday, you just think, yeah, it's going to be a long winter. I've got the. What calendar. are you showing up to the screen? Oh, the calendar. The calendar. Oh, he's already got the calendar. <laughs> the calendar. I'll tell you oh, what. Uh, you think this year was not knackering for everybody you have a look at the final half a dozen races bar valencia yeah ne next year is going to be a long one so uh get some rest while you can pete mclaren <laughs> from crash.net thank you very much as thank you always. guys see you again cheers pete see you soon mate there was so much to discuss from just the test, really, wasn't there, uh, Keith? I mean, uh, Zarco on a, on a Honda for the first time, Mears swapping sides. He's going to work with Santi Hernandez. That's quite quite big news, I suppose, taking Mark Marquez's crew chief. Well, it is. Do you know what? It's, it's an odd thing. You know, Santi Hernandez, a lot of his motivation as a top crew chief will be because of the rider he's worked with and the relationship he's got. It's actually very, very difficult to switch riders, you know, the personality, the, 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 the whole way you go about your business. I've been honest that I've had factory factory ride. And the, the, the fact is that I've, I remember the two factory mechanics that I got with it, but I always had the feeling probably rightly that they kind of felt that they'd been downgraded because they no longer had Randy Mamola, who originally they'd worked with. Um, I'd ended up with Randy's factory bikes in, at Suzuki with Randy's factory mechanics. Um, and obviously, I'd got to go through this learning curve with them as well. We, we had to switch tyres to Dunlop and so on and so forth, and it was awkward. Um, but I did get the feeling, it would, wouldn't have been intentional by them at all, it would have been just one of those psychological sort of trips, that, that they perhaps felt that they'd been given a downgrade by this sort of up-and-coming rider who 
may or may not do the business. And not that you can you can say that about the, uh, you know the the other rider at Repsol because you know he's actually been a very very quick rider and 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 done the business previously. But that gel between crew chief and rider and the infrastructure around them, their own personal management and so on and so forth, is quite tricky to to get back to a level. It's almost on like a, some kind of magical level that you you don't even have to speak. You just can see the, the look on somebody's mm-hmm. face and you can work out, you know, where you're headed with what you're doing. You know, it's a really, really cerebral conundrum that these guys are going to have. And at this level where thousands of a second, you know, count, it's going to be tricky. I just love the fact as well that no one's allowed to say anything, <laughs> especially those that have moved teams. They just got to keep absolute stum. Even though I know that obviously it's obviously con- contractually related, isn't it? But come on, you know, we're at the end now. But there's just that last little bit of oh, sorry, can't say anything. No, no talking. Yeah, nothing. well, I mean, Frankie Carcetti can't say anything, can he? He's he's, he's ducked well from <laughs> from speaking about anything to do with anything. So uh, Carcetti was going to be working with uh, Mark Marquez. I mean, Carcetti is Jake Dixon's manager as well, personal manager. So you. You know, the, the guys in, in the know. I, I, the, what was doing a lot of talking and taking a lot of the, he- the headlines is um, further down the grid, crypto data, RNF. What on earth has happened there? It seems like that has just imploded overnight. What, what on earth, Keith? For the first time ever in this podcast, I'm going to be slightly careful because that Romanian guy, he's got that litigious bloody feel about him that if he if he found a way of actually having a go at somebody in court, he probably would. So uh, yeah, okay. and, and right now he's threatening um, Carmelo Espeleta and Dorna um, uh, with whatever he's threatening them with. I mean, his press release, if you've not seen it, it's on Twitter. I think I've, I've retweeted it. I think it's on my timeline as well. Um is just hilarious. I've never seen anything like it in my life, to be honest. I mean, it's it's part comedy uh, and part business, um, and you can't. And the two parts transpose because really the business and the comedy are, are mixed in one. Uh, effectively, rumor allegedly we'll add them good old caveats. Rumor and allegedly says he hasn't paid his bills, um, and Dorner have basically taken the two slots away from him doesn't affect the Aprilia at all because the factory riders are uh, contracted to Aprilia, not to RNF. Um, the first indication of this was when crypto, when basically Razlan Razali, um, who RNF is the initials of his kids. You know, so Razlan Razali, who was originally circuit um, CEO at Sepang, then he ran the the uh, Patronus Yamaha team, obviously with great effect with Quattararo and co., um, and then finally dropped the Moto3 and Moto2s off the end of the, the plank when uh, Patronus pulled their cash out and went with the present team with Aprilia. All well and good, um, and came up with this crypto data. Um, well, I don't think it's, it's actually, a, it's got nothing to do with, with cryptocurrency. It's more of a, some kind of um, background, something or the other, I don't know. But uh, but like everything to do with crypto, and, uh, and I don't know whether you know anything about cryptocurrency or anything to do with it, um, no, well, I'm glad to see you do that because no, no, I, I it's all it's oh, I, all another it, world it to is me. To me, my wife even bought me a book, um, and I got through the first page, and, <laughs> and and I use it now for for falling asleep because if I'm having trouble yeah. with them, um, yeah, there's a lot of money to be made apparently if you if you if you can do it well. Well, apparently there is. Um, a friend of mine, she made a couple of million quid out of it at one point. Um, she's probably lost half of that by now because I, I put a, a small amount of money into into um, the good old uh, cryptocurrency. And immediately lost half of it, <laughs> and it ain't come back. <laughs> so, so you know, like the whole thing is is, a, is is an interesting concept that that works for some people and not particularly for others. If you want safe investments, I wouldn't say that that was probably one of them. Um, and of course, world events make a big difference as to whether that kind of stuff actually works. And you know, two of the major players, China and 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 Russia, and and some of the Asian countries. Yeah, they they they've put blockages on on cryptocurrencies, so it's not such a a, a a good place to be. But getting away from that, RNF are in big trouble, um, and it's like you say, it's imploded. And I would imagine that if some people are complaining about not having their bills paid, then um, you can see why Dorna have taken away the grid slots. Um, you will still have two Aprilias in those places, but it will be a completely new team. Um, and I think we've got a, 
Have we got a NASCAR player that's come to um, come to join us? Um, I mean, that's a, a bit of an area that I used to be a bit of an expert in once upon a time. Um, you know, an American guy that's looking for a for a, for a, for an opportunity. I just, that's what I love about Americans. You know, they look for these opportunities, and what a, it's a bit like Michael Laverty with Moto Three. You know, and it's a bigger version of that. In that, all of a sudden, Michael Laverty found himself with a couple of months, maybe three, to put together enough of a deal to pinch the two slots that were becoming available in Moto3 on the grid. Michael did it, got Vision Track on board, and it all worked out. Um, it's been a difficult ride for them in the last half of the season in Moto3, but nevertheless, he put it together. Similar fact here. This opportunity does not come up. You do not get an opportunity for two grid slots in MotoGP. It's like hen's teeth. It's like rocking horse poop. You just don't get any of it. Um, so it's kind of one of those situations where... You know, fair dues. If this guy can put the, if this guy can put the money together, and that Dorna are well aware that they need that American market is still sort of struggling just a little bit. We don't have a lot of American, you know, input or, or, or interest. So to to get someone from that background involved, because again, we make the Formula One analogy. It's the Hass thing, isn't it? It's, it's you know, getting mm. the money in from from the, from there and integrating that marketplace. And uh, this guy might well be able to do it. Rosamondo must have had something to do with that. You know, the, the guy that Dorna took on recently. Uh, you know, all of a sudden we're getting a bit more in American influence, which I think MotoGP needs. Um, I'd prefer a little bit more English. Uh, sorry, yeah. United Kingdom uh, um, interest if we can. Um as far as the money's concerned, and you'll get me started. Well, there's still there's still an empty factory manufacturer slot, isn't there? If there's a, a British manufacturer that wants to come in, top line factory bikes, and take those Suzuki positions, never happen. I'm afraid. Um, it's you know, John Bloor isn't daft enough to commit Triumph's future on a MotoGP slot. I don't think so. <laughs> mm. um, so that that's never going to happen. Well, um, I, b I believe the uh, the NASCAR team that wants to take over the running of RNF uh, is 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 owned in part, at least, by the uh, the American rapper singer Pitbull. For those who are familiar with his work, have a Google, have a listen. So we could be getting a bit of glitz and glam next year down at the back end of the MotoGP grid for a good old Fernandez and uh, Oliveira. Um, should we talk about the actual race that that happened as well? Because because Pecco did that? become champion. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Pecco became champion, but in the end, um, Jorge Martin kind of made it easy with his bust up with Marquez that you've already kind of uh, touched on. But also Marquez got a bit of a bust up with Bezecchi. I know you said that Mart Martin's card is marked, but I saw an interview which seemed to kind of, they cleared the air. Marquez and Bezecchi, on the other hand, there is no love lost between those two by the sounds of things. Well, it's um, it's a wonderful thing, MotoGP. I mean, they won't sort it. it, it and it doesn't matter what Marquez and... Uh, um, or hey Martin say in public because these guys nowadays, which is why the surprise is what you've just said, um, generally sorted out. You know, as far as the press and the public are concerned, and then behind the scenes, you know, he's probably chucking darts at Jorge Martin's face on a dartboard somewhere, or um, you know, <laughs> in it, his it, motorhome. It, it, it will sort itself out in uh, in the, in the coming year. I mean, you're right, Bezeki, uh, you know, didn't have a lot of time for for that situation. I mean. There's, it's a long winter, really. Um, they, they're all, they're, they, you know, Valencia was the end of a massive, massive hyped up season of aggression and injury all the way through. We never ended up with a complete grid of the original starters at the beginning of the season. As I said earlier on, you know, Crazy. we've had nine different winners, no no back to back winners through the year, if my calculation is correct, which, you know, correct me if I'm wrong in, in the old um, comments sector below us. So, it's been a hell of a year, really. Um, but you're right, the race. Um, I mean, the big disappointment for me was that Digia, you know, Fabio Digia Antonio ended up getting oh. a bloody tyre penalty. It was the one thing we didn't want at the end. We were lucky it didn't affect it affect us in any other way. But Digia ended up getting that penalty, taking him out of second place and dropping him out of the podium positions. You know, uh, and and that's a shame. Zarco ended up in second place, Brad Bindo in third, but Digi ended up dropping from second to fourth. Um because, you know, and Frankie Carcetti, again, took responsibility for it. It kind of ruined his weekend up, up until the point where he was working for Mark Marquez. Um, <laughs> because, obviously, the tyre pressure was just a bit low for two laps um, out of the, the entire, you know, however many it was, 27-lap race. Um, and it cost Digi a big time. 
And Digi was on for. But this could be foreshadowing, right? But this could be foreshadowing for the the bigger issues next year. This but, could seriously affect the title race. It's difficult to see how they're going to get over it. Next year is a disqualification. This year it's been a warning as your first one, three seconds is your second one, six seconds is your third one, nine seconds is your fourth one <clears throat> of, of of tire pressure transgressions. But the problem is, it's a, it's a it's such a moving target this tire thing at the minute. Depending on where you are in the group. You know, I don't know where those two laps that Frankie Carcetti was on about, where those two laps were in the race. Now, my guess is that, you know, uh, having made, you know, got a, got a gap and got fresh air in front of him, bearing in mind also, by the time the end of the race came, the sun had dropped, the temperature had dropped, the track temperature had dropped, and that is going to lower your tyre pressure. You know, I mean, I know it's not, it's not, a, it's not a linear type thing, you know, because of the of the, the the science of it, but the fact is is that with the changing conditions and wherever you are in a pack, picking up the heat that you're getting from the bikes around you as well, which which obviously make a difference, it's very difficult to to put your tire pressure at the optimum um, pressure. And I don't quite know how they're going to get over that come next year. There's going to be a lot of clever people trying to work it out because that is going to be the key to a world title next year. You cannot afford to be to win the race, twenty-five points on a Sunday, and have them taken away from you, you know that that mm. will make the difference on the championship. And nobody, I mean, hands up, anybody that's even interested in in this affecting the championship, nobody is. You know, Michelin have got to do something. Have got to come up with their idea. They've got to come up with something special that that, that the riders and the teams can work to, because the variability of of where that tire pressure is going to be in a race is impossible to predict. You know, each rider, each team, each bike setup, each nuance, I keep using the word nuance because that's what it's all about now in motorbike racing, the tiniest, tiniest of differences um, are going to make the difference. It's going to be a bloody nightmare come next year, this tyre business. I really, I hate it. They, they need to really sort it out. Um, speaking of sort of penalties, we had a few questions come in about the the penalty that was given to to Brad Binder during the race where he made, you know, had to fall back a position. But it, he let the Aprilia through, and really, it should have been well. The, the I mean, Crissini, he, he passed the Aprilia, but he did do what he was asked. Well, I mean, yeah, but he didn't. He did it after he passed the Aprilia after he had he'd seen the board, and then gave him mm. that you know position back when he should have given the position back that was the one behind him in the first place when it was done. I, technically, very very difficult. I mean, I, to start with, I thought it was a it was a very lenient penalty anyway. Um, to start with, so I think that he got. He, I mean, he got lucky twice. The penalty was lenient, and the actual execution of the penalty was bloody lenient as well. I mean, I, I still think we suffer a bit of inconsistency here and there sometimes with these these decisions that stewards are making. And I didn't really agree with the penalty he got in the first place. I think he should have had a harder one than that. Um, but there you go. He didn't. Um, it's not his fault. He's just riding the motorbike. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, Paco Bagnaia is the champion twice in a row and I think that was fairly well deserved Keith <laughs> well I, I think it was I mean it would have been deserved if Jorge Martin had won it uh, to be frank with you I mean Jorge Martin and he would have got a promotion right to the factory team apparently Jorge Martin is you know off the bike he's the coolest of the two I just noticed a little bit of nerves in in Peco in in the last couple of interviews we saw prior to the race and Jorge Martin was as chilled as they come, like he's just got out of the fridge. Um, but when it comes to the actual race, Peko Bagnaia is the absolute chiller, and Jorge Martin is riding like the guy that's on adrenaline and, and, and you know, basically a little bit more nervous on this occasion. Um, Bagnaia really, really, on, you know, having come off the back of the sprint race on Saturday where, you know, Jorge Martin won the race and put all that pressure on Bagnaia really difficult when you've only got those those few points and and if it had turned around i think it was if 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 we had the same result on the sunday that we had on the saturday as in their positions their represented positions then bangnaya would have won the championship by virtue of count back they would have been equal on points and it would have slipped back to count back uh, which bangnaya would have just won because the count back mm. comes from the sunday races not including the sprint races which again you know, you can make your own mind up whether that's fair or not. Um, 
So it was a, it was a lot of pressure on Magnaia, and he rode an absolute champion's race. You know, he did everything he should do, and and he did it so right. Didn't look he he looked smooth as they come. Um, and Hawaii Martin put himself in that position that that he just couldn't recover from. I mean, so from an excitement point of view, it was brilliant for the few laps that he lasted. But then, of course, he came together with Mark Marquez, took Mark out of the race. You know, Marquez is racing the sprint the day before was just outstanding. I mean, nobody would have expected that Honda to be, but that's Mark. He was, you know, and, and, and one of the reasons why I think perhaps his performance on the Tuesday test wasn't that far. You know, he was in that kind of mood in Valencia. He was, he was riding Valencia, which is a, a cart track at the end of the day. It's not, it's not, you know, you've heard me talk about it before, but when I, when I listen to what ev- all the punters say and everybody says on the TV channels and on the radio channels that I've listened to over the, the last couple of days, poor old Valencia takes a battering. It's a great place. It's a fantastic place. It's given us a great weekend. But it is not probably the track to finish a championship on. Well, we've been there before. We, um, well, I, congratulations. I Sorry, we've done you. it. Congratulations to uh, Peko Banya and Jorge Martin with a with a sterling effort. Shame it ended the way it did. Um, sort of before the race was felt like it got properly underway. Um, let's. So uh, we can't not end the season without having a look at Moto Two and Moto Three. Of course, first of all, because it was a big a big post test for them as well. But first of all, let's just touch on the racing. Uh, Moto Two out of gear. No time he wasted getting to the front. Unchallenged fourth consecutive win. Yeah, I mean he's. He's a bit special. Um, I think another year in Moto Two probably do him win that we get, world. We're going to have an issue though. Where's he going to go? Where's the gaps? Yeah, if he's really, really good, he'll find somewhere to go. Don't worry. <laughs> there'll, there'll be yeah. a gap made. No. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've won't seen keep this me up kind, at night. We've seen this kind of stuff happen before. Contracts are great, and I think I've said it before. They lay out the parameters of of things that are, are set in legal stone. But if you've got an unhappy rider or an unhappy team, or both in some cases, um, you can be fairly sure they're going to find a way out and, 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 and sort it out. Look at Digi. He hadn't got a ride. It looked like he was going to end up having yeah. to go to World Superbikes. And suddenly he's, he's in a, a great team on a bike that's that's probably capable of, of winning races next year. So um, I, I don't know. I mean, for, for me, if we're going to go Moto2, we'll forget about the obvious stuff. Let's go Sam Lowe's, shall we? Sam Lowe's, his final Grand Prix. I mean, Sam Lowe's, you know, the headline, I suppose, is the most successful Grand Prix rider since Barry Sheen in the UK. <laughs> That's a fair accolade, I've got to say. Yeah, he crashes a lot. And the reason why is because he gives a lot. Sam Lowe's has been a fantastic competitor, an absolute gentleman, a real asset to that team. And uh, we've got to wish him well when he goes to World Superbikes. I hope they've got a lot of paperwork and fairing people there because him and his brother are competitors. Now they're in the same series. That is going to be like a nightmare. Um, but the point being is that Sam Lowe's has done done a great job. You know, he's 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 been a a real asset to the sport. Moto two moves over to World Superbikes next year, and I say on behalf of everybody, you know, we wish him really really well. Um, Alex, watch out. His brother is obviously riding in the same series, separate teams. Um, so we've got two big competitions going on there. Sam trying for the world championship, and uh, and 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 fighting with Alex at the same time. Mm, and if you've absolutely. never been out with them, they are competitive at every single thing they ever do. So <laughs> <laughs> get on the shots with the lows. The lows is the lows. Yeah, how do you What's do the it? Plural of lows. Double yeah, vision racing know. is but- back. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that was how Moto2 ended up in the end. Of course, champion already crowned. Moto3, though, Ayumu Suzaki may have been on the bitter end of things and lost out on the title in Qatar, but bounced back in style. Well, Qatar made all the difference, didn't it? Because what's the difference now in points? Six points was it at the end of the series. Let's have a look. Yeah, it was six points. Suzaki should have been world champion. You know, based 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 on that, he, he could well have been world champion if, um, if he'd managed to... Um, I know you can always say... If buts and maybes. Woulda, but shoulda, coulda. Woulda, shoulda, coulda, indeed. There's, there's no room for that, I suppose, in racing anyway. But uh, Jama Masia, yeah, he's world champion. But Sasaki, you know, great race, wasn't it? David Alonso in there, Ivan Ortola. So Colin Vieira, again, again, these are guys that we're going to see a lot more of. Dennis Onchu didn't perhaps have the the weekend. He was, I mean, Valencia, for me, is always about Chan Onchu. You know, when he came and won his first race as a youngster, you know, just out the box. Chan Onchu, his brother, just did the business there, didn't he? going back a few years. So Dennis spending out, but who else was there that was, um, I don't know. I mean, Jaume Masia, you know, 
not the kind of rap that he would have wanted, that's for sure, but just the kind of finish that Sasaki would have wanted. And for both, Pirelli rubber for next Good point. Season. I'm glad you brought that up because it is a major point. I mean, the, the Pirelli tyres straight out of the box on uh, Moto3 and Moto2. Pirelli are the control tyre over uh, both series next year. Um, I think they've got a three-year deal. Um, is it two-year deal? Anyway, doesn't matter. They, they've got the deal. Um, look Multi-year far, deal. I think the Dunlops really had run their course. I think like we, when we had the, the transition from Honda to where we are now in Triumph as power plants, I think the same thing with Dunlop to Pirelli. It's about time. You know, it's a, a fresh set of data. Um, I think the Dunlops, you know, were a bit hard here and there. I mean, you, you got complaints that they were sort of, you know, like a bit of a bowling ball setting now and again and the like. And I think that's, if we go back to the analogy between Honda and, and, and the Triumphs, you know, once we got the Triumphs there, we had that variable, we had that extra performance, we had that extra electronics. It just made the difference became, and I think we're going to see the same thing with Pirelli. I think the tyres, you know, and, yeah, they're going to build a tire that they're going to want to break every lap record they go out because that's what the manufacturers do, don't they? They want to want to kick the old uh, tire company into touch. Um, when Michelin came across Bridgestone, when Bridgestone, you know, came in uh, 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 in front of everybody else, going back a long time in MotoGP, we're going to see the same thing with Pirelli. Um, mm. It's time for a tire change, and they've been fast, and everybody's got on with them. I think in that first test on Monday. All change then for uh, next year. We've just got enough time to answer a couple of questions that have come in, I think, as well from uh, from some listeners. Steve has asked, um, who do you think will be the first rider to win on three different manufacturers, Rins, Vinales or Miller? Of course, pain for Miller at the weekend. Oh, oh I tell you what, I nearly bloody cried. You know, Jack Miller was on <laughs> for being the man that would win on three different manufacturers. I mean, it's a it's a technical point, and does it really matter? But yeah, I suppose it does. Um, I mean, I wanted Miller. I was wishing Miller to 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 get that to to the end, and you know, it would have been great for KTM. It would have been fantastic for Jack Miller to see him back on the form that we know he's capable of. But he had that massive dip in the middle of the season. But who will be first? I think it could be Miller. You know, I think it it could, it could be Miller because I don't I don't know about Vinales. Vinales again. You know, when it comes to the test. Fastest man when it came to qualifying. Fastest man. Da, 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 da. He's, uh, I don't know. We'll see. It's that kind of speculation that we leave to the beginning of the season when we've got nothing else to talk about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll come back to that. And and one final one. This is coming from the centrist. Um, now, I, I think I know what, what he, they're referring to here. Are the themed championship shows after a rider wins organized slash run by Dorna. I get that they're probably trying to appeal to the younger market, but they felt horribly contrived and rather unappealing uh, for years. What do you make of that, Keith? I think that, that, that these awards type things are a bit stifled and they're, that, you know, I think that, I, I mean, if you remember, I'm, the, the, the big FIM awards this year are in Liverpool. They're here in the UK. Um and I think I've said before, I think that we should be more open to the fans. I think we should have a, a more, you know, fan-based club night out where it all goes pear-shaped and everybody gets completely out of control. I think we should put Monster or Red Bull in uh, in, in charge of the yeah. end of season um, award ceremony because they know how to party. Um, and, and I always remember the the, the the Red Bull parties that we all used to go to. In fact... I remember Jack Miller. He was so completely blitzed that he was—he looked like a rolled-up carpet under the arms of two people as they took him out of the club. You know, he was—he was like this long sausage of Jack Miller with the bloke at the front end and the bloke at the back end because he was so—he couldn't walk, he couldn't speak, he couldn't move his limbs. Um, now that's the way to come out of a party. I'm not con- <laughs> maybe I shouldn't condone those kind of things. I don't know, but I'm no, very old school. Believe it, I've noticed. Um, <laughs> but I think I think that we um, there is huge room for that that um, slightly more exciting you know instead of these stand ups with your bow tie on and all the rest. It's good to see everybody dress right. It's good to make a big accolade of it. But it's all a bit FIM, isn't it? You know, the, the rather than than the kind of demographic and the kind of party night that you would expect from motorcycle sport. You know, we we are a bit more raw if you like i think um and and do we really need to go to the you know the kind of autosport awards type thing where we're all down in 
you know, London standing there in our dicky bow ties and on our round, you know, drinking champagne and our, our two hundred thousand pound watches on our arms and all the rest of it. I think it needs to needs to be a bit more for the people. Would be how I saw it, um, how I see it, um, and I think the you know fans deserve a, a bit more out of it. Um, it's televised this year as well. You can watch it on TV if you can stay awake. Um, but any awards ceremony needs a bit more raz, you know, a bit more razzmatazz to it. Uh, and I think that the stand up, yeah, you know, taking nothing away from you know Gavin Emmett did the, the did the, the ones on Sunday night. He does a great job, but it's vanilla. It's just you know, it's a very standard line. Um, uh, and I think that that needs a bit more razzmatazz to it. So yes, I'm in favour of your uh, your writing. I'll uh, I'll put my tuxedo away then and my champagne. Well, you can wear uh, it. You can have your ripped jeans <laughs> off underneath it. And that, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we'll have to wait for that for time. Um, we're out of time for the time being. Thank you very much, as always. Thanks to Pete McLaren, Keith and myself and those who've sent in questions and listening. Uh, and for all the support so far in our sort of revitalised uh, podcast yeah, in the back you know, you know end what? of this I did, season. We did a down the pub the other night, didn't we, me and you, Harry? We, we, we were down the mm. pub again and, and with James Tozen this time, which will be coming up fairly soon on OMG. And it surprised me of how many of the people that were, that joined us in the pub, and there was, you know, it was packed, um, hadn't actually found OMG MotoGP yet. Um, it seems that the, the, the algorithm isn't quite working, it would uh, appear. Having said that, I did notice that the ones that hadn't found us were a little bit older, perhaps, than the you younger persons who are always finding things on the internet, oh, on the internet. On the internet, well, uh, keep, yeah, keep. I mean, keep spreading the news, share, sh- sharing, uh, liking, reviewing, subscribing. A review, especially on Apple Podcasts, goes a massive long way. Um, so you know, we 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 want to come back for next season, and we want to make sure we're able to to do that to to um, the best of our ability, and to make sure that we've got the, the people who actually want to want to hear and see us. Um, we're going to do a little season review as well before the end of the year is out, and uh, James Tozen down the pub will be popping up to quench your uh, lack of MotoGP thirst for over the winter. Um, but for the time being, I think we'll call it there. Thank you very much, Keith. I've been Harry. See you next time.